And so I start again here in the middle, the middle of a life I scarcely know. How many guesses left to get the riddle? The woods are dark, and darker shadows grow. I followed someone here, but lost her leading, with nothing but my lostness left to show. The voice that drew me on is faint and fading, but something else is creeping up behind. Over whose heart, I wonder, are we treading? My shadow beasts can scent, though they are blind. All three are here. Leopard, lion, wolf. My kin and kin, the emblems of my kind. They come to draw me back across the gulf, back from the path I wanted to have chosen. Fall back, they call. You can't run from yourself. Fall to the place where every hope is frozen. But not this time. This time, I choose to choose the other path. Path of the dead and risen. To try the hidden heart of things. To let go. Lose. To lose myself and find again the voice that called and drew me here, my freeing muse. Begin again, she calls. You have the choice. Little by little, you can travel far. Learn to lament before you can rejoice. Sing to the shadows. Sing, and do not fear, but sing them into love, little by little. Begin the song exactly where you are. And so I start again here.
this light shine for the homeless, the destitute, and the refugees.
none of whom wish to reveal their ignorance. None of whom will ask the question. All of whom are bursting to know something. So Jesus says, you know the way to the place where I am going. And they're all going, let's look at each other. What is he on about? And finally Thomas says, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How do we know the way? <laughs> Wonderful. And because Thomas had the courage to ask, to say, I don't know the way. How I don't know where you're going. I've got no idea. How can I know? He got from Jesus one of the most precious and beautiful things in the whole gospel. I am the way and the truth and the life. Wonderful thing. We wouldn't have had that saying if Thomas hadn't had the courage to ask the question. It's that phrase, the way, the camino, as it is in um, Dante's Italian and still in Spain. Now, I don't know if you use water camino. Camino. I know John Vanessa. Have you walked camino? Ah, yeah. oh, excellent. Oh, <laughs> well, the opening line of Dante's Divine Comedy, <coughs> which both one of the songs and the poem I read, uh, as everybody probably knows, is now Mestro di Camino, di Nostra Vita, in the middle of the Camino, the way of our life, Nostra Vita. He says, I found myself in a silver obscura, a dark wood. So, there's a kind of point of contact between Thomas and the Gospel there, and uh, Dante at that moment. In that the most important thing about Dante is not that he's lost, but that he knows that he's lost. <laughs> and that he says, I'm lost. And then he starts to begin to reorient and to look. And he realizes he can't keep running from his own past. The three beasts that come, the shadow beasts that pursue and represent his own obsessions and addictions and persistent failures and those, those um, repetitive and uh, wrongly self-defining patterns and habits that close down on the fullness of someone's growth and development. And um, actually in the end, he needs not to run. He needs a moment of encounter. He needs to be reoriented. And uh, luckily, before he even gets to realizing that, that beautiful thing that Thomas knows, that Jesus is the way, he has two great things going for him, uh, which he's really, for both of which he's forgotten and he lost the way. And those, of course, are love and poetry. Uh, he's got uh, the love of a good woman in heaven who has realised that he's completely lost the way and has, really, uh, has, has realised that her man is completely gone. And she's like, how am I going to sort this guy out? And she realised that it's actually no good at that point sending holy visions or heavenly things or, or you know, beautiful icons or pictures of Jesus or anything like that. She realises that what that man needs directly from the hand of God at that moment to reorient himself, what he really needs is pagan poetry. Pagan poetry is what's going to do it for Dante mm. at that point. So she goes straight to the top and gets the best pagan poet there is, to Virgil, and sends Virgil down, and Virgil meets Dante and starts to sort him out. And in the end, becomes his companion for the first part of a journey. And significantly, the first part of the journey is not running away from the three hellish beasts, but turning around to face them, to see them for what they are, to know them and name them. And in the three terrible regions that you descend down, the three different divisions of, of hell, as Dante and Virgil go round and round the vicious circles, now and inspiring, down to the intense, cold, and frozenness, um, each of them relates to one of the three beasts. And, of course, they get down to the very pit in the centre. They discover, as another one says later on, so across, the way down is the way up. And Dante does a brilliant thing. He takes a piece of the science of his day, and indeed still the science of ours, a piece of knowledge about the world, and it becomes just the most brilliant metaphor. Dante knew that this all this stuff that many people thought the world was flat. It's completely wrong. It's just a piece of um, specious and right. Then he built the world with his right. And uh, Dante knew that the world was a sphere, and he knew that it had a sense of gravity. And he had worked out, a lot of people had worked out, people had read, that if you kept going down and down and down and down and down, you got to the very centre of the earth. If you kept going, if you didn't give up at that point in the absolute pit of the sort of gravitational centre, um, if you just pushed on, 
Without actually changing your direction, you would be going up. <laughs> Everything would flip around. <laughs> and in the same line, you would suddenly be climbing. And what Dante does in his imagination of hell is right in the centre of that bit, the cold frozen bit, is where he places Satan. And when they come down, Satan is looking absolutely terrifying and awesome. <laughs> parody of the Trinity, it's one being with three heads, but instead of the three kind of gloriously and endlessly singing and giving out all joy and love to the cosmos, which is what the Trinity does in heaven, it's just endlessly consuming traitors, it's treachery consuming itself, and he's got three, he's got Judas and Brutus and I forget who all else, and he's just, and they're, they're absolutely horrified by this thing, but they go, Virgil says, keep going, get past this terrible master place, and they go down and down, they go down, let's climb down, as it was set, stuck right in the very centre of the earth, you see. Midriff, right? And they, they climb down, they find a little pass, and they climb right down as the pass is hitting his loins, if you can imagine. <laughs> and then they get past the centre of gravity. And everything flips up. And what they actually see is this absurd fool with his legs sticking up in the air. And, his head <laughs> and they climb up past Satan's legs. And they end up going right up back to the surface of the earth on the antipodes. He'd worked out that there was an Antipodes and realised there must be a landmass there, and that's where he places the mountain of purgatory on this Antipodean island. And he also worked out that there would be different stars there. And bizarrely, when he describes the stars, he says that one of the stars he saw was in the shape of a cross, which it is actually the Southern Cross, but nobody had been to the, as far as we know, to the Antipodes. But anyway, that's it. But hell is imagined as a pit narrowing down. And you go round and round and things get worse and worse. But that negative shape of the kind of conical pit must have its positive correspondence. And he imagines that this horrible pit which was created in his view by the fall of Satan has thrown up onto the other side of the earth a mountain which is the exact same shape as hell except it's pointing upwards and it's in reverse. And so he reverses the circles. He didn't know the water goes round the other way on the interview. He reverses the circle. And this time, there's still suffering, there's still pain, there's still labour, there's still night and day, there's still journey. But this time, the suffering is getting you something. And yes, you seem to be going around in circles, just like you said, you keep getting back to the same point. But each time, you're a little bit higher. You're a little bit further away. You're a little bit closer to where you're trying to get. Because he imagines the garden of our origins and our beginnings at the top of this mountain. And the seven deadly sins are purged starting with pride at the bottom and going up and finally, of course, the circle of fire is for lust, which is the one he's worried about because that's a, poets have lust issues on the whole. And so, uh, <laughs> he, he, he has the place that there's a wonderful gathering of hesitant poets right outside the circle, just not quite sure whether they're going to dare to dance through the fire. T.S. Eliot, of course, recognised the same issue, so he has that, he imagines Dante coming back to see him when he's thinking about when he was, was a fire watcher. Blitz. And in Little Giddy, he imagines Dante coming towards him. And Dante says to him, um, You know, the passage now presents no hindrance, for the spirit unappeased and peregrine, peregrine is like pilgrim. And then he says, From wrong to wrong, the exasperated spirit proceeds, unless restored by that refining fire where you must move in measure like a dancer. So Dante uh, uh, arrives there and gets uh, not actually at first a kiss, but a very severe telling off from Beatrice, who gets into full Italian dog and rigging him. He lays him to him for uh, several hundred lines. But <laughs> eventually she forgives him. And, uh, and they, they proceed on in the final book up through the different spheres of the heavens and to parallel to, to, to the, the heaven of heavens, and eventually a beautiful, beautiful vision of the Trinity, which is the full positive.
So he's a companion and he's a destination. But he said something even more radical. He said, I am the way itself, the very path you tread. And I find that intensely helpful and comforting. Because as I read the story of the journey of Dante, and as I look back at my own journey, and what I know the journeys of others, um, there are many dark passages in the way. There are many overshadowed places. There are times when you think that you've lost the path and you haven't. There are times when you have lost the path and you need to be brought back onto it. And there are times that seem to be uh, sort of completely dead end roadblocks and you have to wait for every time to flip or um, learn, uh, as the beautiful hymn says, to strike the living waters from the rocks along the way. And for me to know that Christ himself, at all those points, is the way that I'm walking. But it's not simply something I strain towards or nostalgically look at behind. But he literally is the road. In that sense, I might occasionally feel like I've lost the way. But what I know now is that the way himself will never lose me. I'm on a path which is personal and isn't finished with me yet. And if I lose the path, the path is going to come back and find me. And that's an incredibly helpful thing I hope in that way to leave you with. Um, you may, in the other songs of the Come, my lady, 
walking down the street. Yeah. 